Hi everyone, my name is Maurice. I'm the Healthy Speechy. Um, thank you all for watching today's video. Uh, you have hopefully seen the other videos prior to today. Uh, one of them was going over hearing, one of them was going over just basic what do I do as a speech therapist, one of them is a what do I do at my facility. Um, and there's at least one more that I can't remember. But today's video is going to focus on some medical terminology and abbreviations that you're going to come across working in a healthcare setting. Um, as a speech therapist, we don't really get a lot of training on different diagnosis per se or abbreviations for different diagnosis. We know the big ones, but we have trouble finding out the other ones. So we do what everyone else does. Google it, figure it out. Um, ask someone else, what does this stand for? What does this mean? And go from there. Um, yeah. So I'm going to give you a basic outline of what you'd see. So the first one is DX. So DX is the diagnosis, what the patient is diagnosed with. Um, and we'll be going over some of the diagnosis throughout the video. So PMH is the prior medical history. So that's anything that is relevant to the patient. So where they may have admitted with one diagnosis, they have other diagnoses that are going on. Um, so it's like if you cut your finger. Okay, yes, yeah, so you went in for the cut on your finger, but what if you also have diabetes or if you have um, hemophilia or anything like that that may be pertinent information for the doctor, the nurses, the therapist to also know. Um, Rx is prescription. FX, I use this as function. It can be function medically as well, but it's my shorthand more than anything, I think. And I've taught people to use it too, so. SX is surgery. So if you see that the patient had a hip fracture and then it says SX and it has a date, well, it tells you, hey, the surgery was on this date. Um, you'll see A and O, which is alert and oriented. Um, typically, it's A and O times whatever. Are they alert and oriented times one, two, three, four? Um, is it just person? Is it person place? Is it person place um, time, situation, what's going on? Sometimes you'll also see S slash P, which is status post. So a uh, hip fracture status post um, repair on whatever date kind of thing, or status post GPEG placement, status post tracheostomy. Um, next up is you'll see H slash O, and that's history of. So they have a history of X, Y, Z. In notes, you'll see S slash S, which is signs and symptoms. So patients may have signs and symptoms of aspiration, signs and symptoms of a CVA, signs and symptoms of a heart attack, um, things of that sort. Oftentimes you'll see the C with the line above it. That is with, so um, may crush meds with pudding kind of thing. And if it's a S, with a slash over it or a line over it, it's without. It's the difference, with, without. Um, so maybe thin liquids without a straw um, or things of that sort. H-O-H, it's not H, O-H, but it is. Anyways, ignore me. So hard of hearing. You'll see this oftentimes with any patient who has hearing impairments, who needs an amplifier, who needs um, their hearing aids, who is just deaf and they're unable to hear. Um, sometimes I'll write that in our notes. So today I evaluated a patient who was hard of hearing. He does have hearing aids, but he doesn't have them with him. Um, but I documented that in the notes and on my little uh, scrap sheet so that Anyone who treats him knows, hey, he is hard of hearing. Um, all right, next up, I'm going to dysphagia. So we have our bolus. So the bolus is any food or drink. It's 
saliva even. It's the, how did I write this? Uh, the fluid drink or saliva that's in the oral cavity. So it's what you end up swallowing. So if you take a pull from your soda, or water in my case, I took a pull of the water and what I pulled into my mouth is considered the bolus. So then when you're working with swallowing, you're monitoring how the bolus moves, how fast, how timely and such. So you would see OTT in some of your notes and that's the oral transit time. So how long did it take for you to get the bolus from your lips pretty much until you started the pharyngeal phase, which is where the swallow actually passes through the pharynx. Um, epiglottis in the very back of your throat you have a little flap it's a leaf-like flap and the goal of that if this is your esophagus and this is your trachea the goal of this little flap is to tip over when you swallow the food and drink push it over so it tips over to protect your trachea and hopefully shoot everything into your esophagus which is where it's supposed to go um sometimes so it's epiglottis uh, sometimes when you're doing swallow studies, you'll see, or reading swallow study reports, you'll see pulling in the vallecula. So vallecula is the next one. And what the vallecula is, is the space between the base of the tongue and the epiglottis. So I just went over the epiglottis is what tips over to protect the, actually I should do it this way, tips over, which is to protect the trachea and your vocal folds and your lungs and all that good stuff from having food or drink in it. So what happens sometimes if they have a delayed oral transit time, they have decreased sensation, they have a weak base of tongue, you'll see some pulling into the vallecula. So the little V starts to fill up. Sometimes it actually even overflows into the piriform sinuses, which are down here, closer to the um, esophagus. <laughs> um, but yes, so you'll see vallecula. UES is the upper esophageal sphincter. So with the upper esophageal sphincter, it's typically closed. That's its resting posture. Um, and what happens is when your larynx pulls up and out, it pulls it open. And then that's when the actual swallow happens. And as soon as your larynx returns to its original spot, it closes back up again. Um, it's closed because we're mainly breathing as opposed to swallowing majority of the time. So we have MBSS. I did mention that, that's a modified barium swallow study. We do complete these at my facility and I have um, a couple of friends who are really awesome. One of them does swallow studies literally all day and I absolutely love her. And hopefully I'll get her on this show at some point. But a uh, modified barium swallow study, layman's terms, it's a video x-ray. So we'll coat the food and drink with barium. That way it allows for a contrast when you're eating and drinking. And we track the bolus from when it enters the oral cavity until they actually swallow. Depending on who your radiologist is, who the speech therapist is, the condition of the patient, um, sometimes they cut the actual on time, so the radiation exposure short to just see maybe the end of the oral and the pharyngeal phase and they'll stop it. Some uh, clinicians will have it continuous throughout the full study and all the presentations. So you could see well, what was happening in between. Did they um, have penetration or aspiration after the swallow? Did they trigger an automatic swallow? Was it productive? Was it not productive? Was it the throat clear? And you could see, was it productive? So did the food or drink come up? or um, maybe it aspirated and went straight down. So there's more radiation exposure, but you get a better picture. Um, the other thing that we do with swallow studies, depending on your tech and depending on the clinician, I know when I worked at the nursing home and my friend would come over and um, do them in a mobile van, we would always do the lateral view, which is seeing it this way. And then we turn them anterior posterior so that you could actually see the bolus. You could see the vocal folds if they're adducting, um, or maybe there's paralysis or paresis on one of the sides or both of the sides. Uh, you would see it actually pass through the esophagus, upper, upper esophageal sphincter down to the esophagus and exit out of the lower esophageal sphincter. They also make sure 
that um, it empties into the stomach. That way you know, well, are they having reflux? Do you see it coming back up? Do you see a pocket? Do they have a Zanker's diverticulum? Um, what else may be going on? So I've seen quite a few of swallow studies and I've completed a couple as well. Um, yeah, I don't know. I've talked to people and no matter how many they've done, they still wouldn't say that they are perfect. And I think that's the beauty of our field, that no matter how comfortable you are, there's still more you can learn. There's still something that you may have missed that maybe someone else has found um, or could point out to you and help you learn that way, which is why I ask you for comments and such here too. Uh, another assessment is a fees, which is a fiber optic endoscopic evaluation of swallowing. So for this one, they give you, well, they don't give you, um, you end up having a camera, a very tiny camera, inserted through your nose, and it looks through the back of your throat. This is to focus mainly on the pharyngeal phase. They'll coat the food or drink in a different color, typically, so that they can see the contrast between the tissues and the actual presentation, the bolus. There is a whiteout that happens when the swallow happens. And ideally, if we could get both of these together, that would work out. Not at the same time, maybe. But if you could get both of them together, that would work out. Because it'll allow you to see, okay, this is a gross idea of what's happening. Here's a real life idea of what's happening as well. Um, there's pros and cons to both of them. And so every facility is different. We don't really do fees at our facility. Um, I have another really good friend who does do fees and she's amazing. Um, so yes, it just depends. So some of the things you'll notice when you're doing a swallow study is you'll have penetration. So penetration or even a bedside. So penetration is when food or drink, um, goes the wrong way, but it stays above the vocal folds. That's the biggest difference. So it may get to right above the vocal folds and maybe they squeeze it out to a timely swallow. Um, yeah, it doesn't go past the vocal folds, so it doesn't get to your lungs, but you're at a higher risk. When it goes past the vocal folds, you end up with aspiration. So aspiration is going past the vocal folds, which gets down to um, your lungs, the branches and such, which puts you at risk for pneumonia, um, among with other things. So if someone does aspirate, you wanna know, do they feel it? Is it silent? that they didn't feel it and therefore they can't protect themselves? Or is it, um, do they have a reflexive cough that they start to cough to try and get it out? Was it successful, was it unsuccessful? And all those things we wanna document in our reports to make sure that whoever's reading them has a, the best picture possible of what actually occurred. Um, sometimes you will end up with aspiration pneumonia, which is what I was talking about. So this is food or drink even bodily fluids that go the wrong way. So they dip below the vocal folds and you end up with a bacterial infection. Um, it can be extremely dangerous, especially if you don't catch it on time, just like any other infection. And the patients who typically get aspiration pneumonia are more often than not already sick. So they're already medically fragile. Um, some of the things you may see along those lines is emesis, which is vomiting. So the patient's having emesis. The patient is vomiting. Um, the patient had emesis and it resulted in aspiration pneumonia, things like that. So emesis is another term for vomiting. And then when you're doing feeding tasks or working on education in your notes or someone else's notes, you may see SSS. So safe swallow strategies. So this would be the chin tuck, alternating bolus size, um, maybe alternating temperatures, the textures, um, positioning, turning your head, um, thickeners, um, modified diets, things of that sort. And those would be some of the safe solo strategies that we educate and train on. That's the dysphagia portion. So after that, we're moving into some pulmonary and respiratory. So sometimes you'll see SOB, for a minute, I thought this was son of a, you know. Um, 
And obviously it's not, but every time I see it, that's exactly what I think of because of how I was raised, I guess, I don't know. But it's shortness of breath. So if a patient has shortness of breath, you'll see it in the documentation, patient presented with SOB, um, and then they followed up with whatever they needed to follow up with oxygen or further assessments, things of that sort. So you would also see the snick, not so sure how to say this, um, but I did see it in one of the charts recently and I had to Google it because I didn't know what it was. Um, but all it means is shortness of breath. It's a more scientific term, which is probably better to use if you're beefing up your documentation. Um, okay. So then you'll see auscultation and auscultation is what you use a stethoscope for. So as a speech therapist, we use stethoscopes as well, as well as nursing and doctors and respiratory and all of their disciplines. It's not just a doctor stethoscope, um, as you may have heard at some point. Uh, so we would use this to auscultate the lungs, to hear the lungs, hear how they sound, um, auscultate the heart, hear the heart. We also um, listen for the air gap. If a patient has a passing mirror valve, which is the next one, if a patient has a passing mirror valve, um, or if they don't have a passing mirror valve, but they do have a tracheostomy, uh, they have the tube coming out of their throat, there's different variations. It could be cuffed, it could be non-cuffed, it could be a foam cuff, it could be a water cuff, it could be an air cuff. So if it's an air cuff, um, we'd wanna make sure, or even the water cuff, the liquids, we'd wanna make sure that we deflate it before you put on the passing mirror valve. Um, that way it allows for air to pass around the cuff. If this is your trachea and this is the tracheostomy tube, um, if it's puffed with the cuff inflated, well, there's no way to get the air around it so that you, the patient wouldn't be able to breathe um, other than through the tube. So if you cap the tube, then there's no way to get the air out or in. So you'd want to decuff it, which is making it open so that you can see the space. Um, and we would listen for an air gap. So you would auscultate right here and you would listen, deflate the cuff and you should hear a um, So yeah, and we actually just got our first passing mirror valve patient in a while. And he should be interesting this week. He's a couple years, quite a few years, status post tracheostomy placement, uh, GPEG placement. And he said he's been using that passing mirror for a year. Um, but he was still lacking education because he was, he didn't understand that it's a one-way valve. So with the passing mirror valves, it's a one-way valve. The air flows through, but it doesn't come back out. So it allows them to breathe through the um, tracheostomy and then it caps off to reroute the air to the oral cavity and allow for artic articulation. Um, some of the other diagnoses you'd see, COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Um, with this, the airflow is obstructed. We have a lot of patients with COPD here in South Texas and I'm not completely sure why. Um, more often than not, they have a thicker sputum. They may be on oxygen. Um, they cough a lot. They have wheezing breath uh, and things of that sort. Sometimes we'll see pulmonary fibrosis. And this is scarring of the lungs, which also makes it hard to breathe, as you can tell. So they would have the shortness of breath that we were talking about. They'd also have thickened walls. So the walls of their lungs would be thicker, in which case it's harder to get the oxygen flow um, the right way into their blood. Sometimes we come across atelectasis, which is the collapse or closure of the lung. So if a patient's lung collapses, um, like my husband, when he rolled a four-wheeler, his lung had collapsed, so he had atelectasis. 
Um, luckily, he had great medical intervention and he's been just fine. And that happened way before we were dating. Because I would have had a fit. So, <laughs> uh, breath stacking. So, breath stacking is similar to hyperventilating is what I relate it to. So, when you breathe in, but you can't get all that air out. So, then the pressure starts building and building and building, um, which results in the inability to actually breathe. Because you're just stacking and you're not letting it out. So, there's nowhere for the breath to go. Um, and you could end up with... Um, carbon dioxide poisoning in that case. Next up, we're moving on to the heart. Um, your lungs and your heart work very well together. We do have a lot of cardiac patients here in South Texas as well, so much so that we have um, a hospital, McAllen Heart Hospital, that is strictly cardiac. Um, the hospital I work for, we are working on getting our cardiac certification. Hopefully by the end of the year, we will have that completed and we'll be stroke certified and cardiac certified, um, which is really great. And then I think there's talks about working on outpatient cardiac as well. So some of the diagnoses that we see in that aspect include HDL, which is hyperlipidemia. So that's increased effects in your blood. So that could lead to uh, strokes, uh, heart attacks, blockages, things of that sort. Uh, you would see HTN, which is hypertension or high blood pressure. Sometimes you see CAD, which is coronary artery disease. So for this, the plaque builds up on the walls and it restricts the amount of flow. The other thing that could happen is the plaques could actually break off and cause further damage like a, it's in here, like a myocardial infarct, which is a heart attack. Um, so the blood flow would have stopped and it causes your heart to stop, which causes all sorts of distress and that's not what we want. So another one you may see is PAD, which is peripheral artery disease. So this is where coronary was in your heart, Peripheral is your arms, your stomach, your legs. It's most common in your legs. Um, and yes, the arteries are blocked. So then you'll have patients come in with a cabbage, coronary artery bypass grafting. Um, when you see a cabbage, you'll typically see cabbage times one, cabbage times two, cabbage times three, cabbage times four, depending on how many revisions that they did. And the goal of the revisions is to increase the blood flow to allow your heart to work better. Um, when they're doing these, or if a patient's uh, having a myocardial infarct, they're having a heart attack, they present with signs and symptoms of a heart attack, they'll often request an EKG or an ECG, which is placement of electrodes on their abdomen and thoracic cavities, and it allows them to have a better picture of what exactly the heart is doing. Is it steady? Is it fast? Is it slow? Is it erratic? Um, and they'll follow up with care from that. So if you have atrial fibrillation or AFib, um, your heartbeat is erratic. So it may be which would be extremely uncomfortable. Um, extremely. And for this, it leads to clots, strokes, heart failure, and all sorts of other things. Uh, the other thing that you may see is bradycardia, which is where your resting heart rate is below 60 beats per minute. So your heart is slowing down, which is a problem. You don't want it too fast, but you don't want it too slow. Um, you'd want it to just be a regular happy rhythm. So with some of the cardiac patients that we see, because of the change in blood flow, you end up seeing edema. So edema is swelling and it's of pretty much any body part. Um, and swelling isn't good. You don't want swelling. It does happen to pregnant women. So in my case, I had edema on my legs um, last week. And part of it had to do with the fact that, or my theory at least, had to do with the fact that I was sitting in a car for five hours as we were coming back from Austin 
and I wasn't walking enough at that time. So as a result of that and not eating the best food while we were in Austin, um, I had decreased circulation. So the fluid was building up, which is why I'm wearing compression socks now, because that's what pregnant women do. So yes, edema is swelling. Uh, it's typically a fluid, excessive fluid. So you'll have patients with PVD, peripheral vascular disease. So this is the blood vessels outside of the heart and they narrow or spasm and it causes pain, uh, fatigue, weakness, and it's typically in your legs. Um, sometimes you'll see radial, what? Radio, radiculopathy. <laughs> it wasn't coming out. Okay, so you'll see radiculopathy, and this has to do with pinched nerves. So you'll have pain, weakness, numbness, um, and difficulty controlling the muscles. So I believe I have radiculopathy in my shoulder, considering I can't do more than this right now. Um, and it's a pinched nerve. Sometimes you'll see patients with hematomas, which are bleeds outside of the blood vessels, so like a bruise. Uh, a lot of our patients who have heart diagnosis are on some sort of blood thinner, in which case they would bruise easier. Uh, for We're moving into bones now. So if a patient has a hip fracture, sometimes you'll see this. So it's an ORIF, O-R-I-F, and it's an open reduction internal fixation. So they move the bone back into place and then they fixate it with screws and rods um, to keep it in place and make sure that it heals correctly. So two, no, one of the patients that I evaluated today had an ORIF, a status post fall. You'll have TKR or TKA, um, they're two different acronyms, but it's ideally the same thing. So it's a total knee replacement or a total knee arthroplasty, which is a replacement. Um, sometimes you'll see patients with BKA, which is a below the knee amputation. So they remove the part of your leg from the knee down. Um, it could be a partial, it could be a full. Um, I've seen both. Uh, you could have an AKA, which is not Alpha Kappa Alpha. Uh, it's above knee amputation. So maybe they were unable to save the leg because the patient had PVD, peripheral vascular disease, um, or they were going gangrene. Maybe <clears throat> their body was killing itself in which case they may need an above the knee amputation. The doctors try and save as much as possible to allow for the best healing and the best recovery with use of possible prosthesis upon healing. However, sometimes life happens. So you may see osteomyelitis, which is an infection of the bone. So oftentimes what I've seen is patients who end up with osteomyelitis and if their body's not responding to the care or um, it's not responding to whatever we may be doing to try and help them, they may end up with an amputation. Um, DJD, degenerative joint disease. So that's wear and tear. As we get older um, or we have overuse, so runners may need to get knee replacements or um, tennis players, may need to have their elbows or their shoulders looked at because they have wear and tear from overuse um, or just age, it happens. Sometimes you will see a laminectomy. So for a laminectomy, they remove a portion of the vertebral bone. It's the root of the spinal canal. So you have your um, vertebral column and so they remove the root part um, and I've seen a bunch of patients with laminectomies. In relation to speech, sometimes they end up with swallowing impairments and sometimes they're just fine. Um, but they usually do this as a result of spinal stenosis. So this is where there's a narrowing of the spinal canal. And so when it's narrow, it cuts off the circulation and the room that your spinal cord needs, in which case it causes pain, discomfort, um, and all sorts of other issues. 
So you'll see patient presents with spinal stenosis, um, and then you'll see laminectomy conducted on whatever day. Another thing you may see is spondylosis, which is the degeneration of the spinal conduit column. So the degeneration of the spinal column what may result in a laminectomy as well. Um, and then I've seen this a handful of times. So cauda equina syndrome, and there's a bundle of nerves at the base of your spine. And what happens there is it's damaged. It could be spondylosis, it could be um, the stenosis, or it could be as a result of a fall or all sorts of things. But what that does is it causes lower extremity weakness, uh, loss of bowel and bladder, pain, numbness, neuropathy, um, and issues of that sort. So some of the other things that you'd see in relation to nerves is MS, which is multiple sclerosis. So the myelin sheath, which is what coats our nerves, it starts to break down. And when that breaks down, that makes everything painful. Um, I know Selma Blair has MS. Uh, one of my husband's friends has MS. Um, and I've actually had a patient whose son, who was like maybe 20, 21, had MS or has MS as well. Um, but yeah, painful. And there's different levels, just like almost everything else. Uh, some of the other diagnoses you'd see is syncope. And syncope is fainting. So patient presented with an episode of syncope. It resulted in a hematoma to uh, the skull. Um, we all have ADEM, which is acute disseminated encephal encephalomyelitis, inflammation of the brain or the spinal cords. So the damage is the nerves and the myelin. So just like we were talking about, it causes more pain and discomfort. Um, and it's harder to move or do anything really because everything's painful. So some of the patients, when they're having any sort of brain issues, they would request an EEG, an electroencephalogram. So this is where they put electrodes all over your head and they assess your brain activity. If you see my hand moving, it's because Toby decided to join me. Um, so they're assessing your brain activity with an EEG as opposed to the EKG or the ECG, which is assessing your heart. Um, so you'll see patients with critical illness myopathy. And this is one that I had no idea what it was, but it happened to a lot of our patients that we have at inpatient. And I had to look it up and I had to learn. And what it means is that their body had a significant decline during their time in the acute stay. I, more often than not in the ICU, um, they had trouble with their extremities or even their lungs and it's just weakness. They have severe weakness, so we have to get them stronger. Uh, some of the patients who go, who get sick, we end up seeing a diagnosis of metabolic encephalopathy. So that's an alternation of the brain function or consciousness due to other organs. So maybe your kidneys are shutting down or your um, heart is shutting down and it's causing your brain to have to compensate in one way or another, and it changes your brain function. Um, you're not thinking the way you normally would or as safe as you normally would. So we see patients with metabolic encephalopathy and we help to get them back to their prior level. Ideally, their brain has returned to a homeostasis and normal, and our goal is to help them get back to their regular. So we'll see patients with a CVA a cerebrovascular accident or a stroke. Um, we'll see patients with hemiparesis, which is weakness of one side of the body or a limb. Sometimes it's um, just the arm, sometimes it's the arm and the leg, sometimes it's the arm and leg face, sometimes arm, leg, face, throat, um, the vocal folds. It could be all sorts of things. Um, the last bunch, ready? You'll see patients with CA, cancer. Not fun, 
but it's one of the diagnoses. Some of our patients, when their organs are shutting down, they end up going into septic shock. So it's organ or injury or damage in response to an infection. So oftentimes our patients may end up with a UTI, which is over here somewhere. Um, and the UTI is a, where'd it go? Here it is. A UTI is a urinary tract infection. So patients get a UTI, let's say we weren't able to detect it, especially in a nursing home when I was working in a nursing home. It took us a while to detect it. Some of their signs and symptoms would be a change in color or odor of their urine. Um, they may have frequent urgency to urinate. However, very little actually comes out. It may be painful. And then with our elderly patients, you'll often see them get confused or have abnormal behaviors from their norm. So if they're usually really calm and quiet, maybe they're more aggressive and active. Or if they are typically loud, they may be more quiet and reserved. It just depends. But if we don't catch it in time, or if they have a blood infection, then they could end up going into septic shock. Um, their blood pressure drops, they get fever, they have abnormal um, reactions. So the job of the doctors and the nurses is to help get them safe and stable so that we could help get them better. Some of our patients have CKD, chronic kidney disease. So the kidneys stop functioning over time. A lot of the times when that happens, they'll end up with ESRD or end-stage renal disease. So the kidneys are no longer working and then they require dialysis, which removes excess fluid. Um, patients with dialysis, something that you'll learn that I learned is that they don't typically void because they have no fluids. They remove the fluids um, from their body via dialysis. And if they don't remove them, they typically end up in pain, unable to breathe, a lot of abdominal pain and discomfort. Some of our patients, quite a few of them in South Texas, have DM or diabetes mellitus. Um, and yes, diabetes. And they may be IDDM, which is insulin dependent diabetes mellitus. Mellitus? Mellitus. Um, some of our male patients will have benign prostate hyperplasia. Plasia? Um, and it's in a large prostate, which causes discomfort, urgency, um, pain, and it becomes harder to detect a UTI because their symptoms are so similar. Some of our patients will end up with hyperkalemia, which is an increase in potassium in your blood. So this could lead to heart palpitations, muscle pain, weakness, numbness, um, discomfort. You may have some with hyponatremia which is low sodium. So our body's made up of these chemicals and these elements and they have a nice homeostasis happiness of where they like to be. And if it's too high, we're in trouble. If it's too low, we're in trouble. Our bodies typically do a really great job of keeping us happy, but sometimes you end up with hyponatremia or low sodium, especially if you drink too much water and not enough um, vitamins and minerals. So you would have a changing cognition, some headaches, nausea, and poor balance. Some patients will end up with hypoosmality, which is a drop in the osmality of the blood fluid. So the fluid volume increases and the solutes, so those vitamins and those nutrients, those minerals drop, and it results in neuro, neuro deficits. Um, some of our patients end up with MRSA, which is methicillin resistant staphylococcus, Arius. Um, this is considered a superbug. You don't want to get this. Um, it's resistant, like I said, to several different antibiotics, which is why it's very careful. To, it's very important to follow the recommended um, dosage and time frame for the antibiotics when the doctors give it to you. You don't want to be hopping around to different ones because it doesn't work or this one doesn't work. Stay the course, talk to your doctor, let them help you. Also, I live really close to the border. Um, and it used to be very common for us to just hop across and get a Z pack or um, a, any sort of antibiotic at this point. And I've learned not to do that over the years just because it's more dangerous. Uh, if you self diagnose and you self prescribe, um, or you're getting stuff from different physicians, it may not work 
the way it's supposed to, in which case you could end up with a superbug, something that's resistant. Another thing that you may see is ESBL, extended spectrum beta lactamase. Uh, this is also a superbug, and typically we'll see ESBL to the urine, whereas MRSA, you can have MRSA to the nares, you could have MRSA to a wound, um, surgical wounds and things like that. So yeah, all scary. But yes, ESBL is typically in the urine is where I've seen it more than anywhere else, sometimes in the blood. Um, and the last two are two that I came across recently and I had no idea what they were. So I Googled them and I figured it out. Uh, this one is Leomyoma uteri which is tumors in the smooth muscle of the uterus. So the patient has tumors in her uterus. And then ETOH abuse, which is ethanol abuse, another term for alcohol abuse. Um, but this sounds way more fancy than alcohol abuse. And that is it for our crash course on medical terminology. <laughs> um, I hope this helped you. Uh, feel free to rewatch it or ask questions and I will try my best to answer to the best of my ability. And you did this many. Um, like I always say, subscribe, like, share. Um, if you have any comments or suggestions, feel free to comment here or send me a message. Um, I'm on Instagram, I'm on Facebook, I'm on YouTube, obviously. And yeah. If you feel like keeping up with my day-to-day -day, as opposed to or along with uh, seeing the weekly videos that I do, feel free to follow me on Instagram. I'm always posting in stories, uh, a day in the life kind of things of what I've done or gone through that day. And yeah, hope you have a great week. I will see you all next week.